Uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, this holy week we recognize the uh, just the amazing gift of, of love that you have given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And uh, what a tremendous gift that, that he has come to be the Savior of the whole world. And, and, um, and so we want the whole world to know the, this great gift that you've given to us. And, and so uh, be with us tonight and, and open our eyes to, uh, to not only to see your love, but to uh, recognize ways that we can share that love uh, with all the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Hey, what's going on? Great to see you. What are you doing here? We don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Oh, really? How are you? Do you want the stage light back on? Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, tonight we're actually going to get into what we've sort of been leading up to uh, for the past three sessions, and, and that is uh, some actually strategies and techniques to take everything um, that we've talked about and, and, and implement it. Um, so, but first, be, before that, um, did anybody uh, with the, the homework any any reactions to that or, or any reactions to last time? It's been a month. <laughs> we we did the Lord's Prayer, you know, our articles out of the Catechism. Yeah, I, I'm glad we did it. Yeah, um, I'm I'm not quite sure. I saw how it sort of related to what we've been talking about in the class, but it was actually kind of a nice thing to do. Okay. Right. Right. Any other reaction? I just noticed about myself that um, when I'm afraid, when I'm afraid, I'm my behavior is is not friendly, welcoming, blah blah blah. And I, I keep thinking, okay, just a lot of people who don't quake in fear, but are kind of not, you don't want to be, you're, you know, they're not appealing, but. It, could be fear. Just remember what I've learned about myself, you know. Yeah. Right on, Alex. I mean, that the Lord's Prayer exercise. It was. It wasn't so much an, an outreach exercise as it was a spiritual growth exercise. <laughs> and um, it's just kind of the idea of of um, you uh, can't fill from an empty cup, and so it's just one way to to sort of help. Um, you know, seek God's guidance and, and just aligning your will with His. And, um, and so just th those sorts of, of exercises um, are, can just be, be helpful to, you know, for your own personal growth. And, and the, more, uh, the more experience you have, the more growth you have, um, then when, when you find yourself in various situations, I mean, I, I, so often, um, because I, I do my, my personal Bible reading on the way to, 
to the office um, in the in the morning in the car with an audio Bible, and and so often there's something that I hear there that where I'm talking to someone later that day and I go, I was just listening to this this morning, and this this perfectly applies to you know or or I'll hear somebody else talking about something else entirely, and it's it's just it's a, it's a connection. Um, you know, between those two things, and, and it's amazing. It's not all the time, um, but I'm amazed how often it, it's just, oh, this perfectly fits um, with that. So, all right, my remote is dead. Um. So the first thing with, um, as far as just sharing your faith in general, is listening. And then listening some more, and listening some more. And, um, and, and, when, and when the person you're talking to is, is done talking, ask questions about what they said so that you can listen some more. All right? um, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, and it sounds simple, and it sounds obvious, but... Um, so often we can, when someone's talking about just where they're at with things or, or whatever it is, that there's a tendency to you, you sort of hear what they, you know, what they say or the, and something, and then and you want to respond right away. Like you want to correct them or you want to, oh, well, I've got the answer to that or, you know, or, or, or something like that. And, and, um, and, and so... So there's this, it's, it's just, it's, it can be really hard um, to just listen. Especially when they say something, you go, oh, wait, no, that's not right, or that, you know, or, or something like that. But stop and listen, because they want to, they want to be heard. People want to be heard. Um, and, and I don't mean this in a, um, in a, in a, in a uh, demeaning way, but, uh, everyone loves the sound of their own voice, <laughs> right? We like to talk about ourselves, right? We do, and everyone does. And so, um, and and being com- if someone is comfortable enough to actually do that with you, man, what a blessing that is, all right? Um, because, I mean, there's there's plenty of of people that that I talk to that don't open up. And then it's like, where do I, I, I don't know how to help you. I, I don't know what I can do for, I don't know how to connect with you because I don't know enough about you to know where you're at. And the thing is we can hear, you know, people say something and, um, and then sort of jump to conclusions about why they are where they're at. All right. Um, but always dig deeper and dig deeper and, and, and say, you know, why do you feel that way? Why is that? you know, the situation, um, you know, tell me more about that. And sometimes the easiest way to do that is to actually repeat back what the last words they say to you. You know, um, this is, this is a, a technique that I, I give to, um, to husbands that, um, that when their, their wives want to talk and, and they're so like quick to, oh, I just want to fix it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That right. never happened. Like every couple, okay. <laughs> so, um, right. See, when 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 she says, you know, tells you, you know, this is, you know, frustrated, or whatever, you know, oh, I'm frustrated. I had a really rough day. All right. You repeat the last few words. A rough day. Yeah. And then they'll talk some more. All right. It's it's a neat little trick to just to draw more out of the person. And, 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 you know, because what you're doing is you are giving them permission and to you know, tell me more. I, I want to hear. I care about you enough that I want to know what's on your mind. All right. And um, there's an old saying, they don't know or they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. All right. And it's absolutely true. Um, you know, I, I think about uh, the teachers that I had. And um, just all, all through my years of schooling, right? The ones that I learned the most from are the ones that I felt really cared about me. 
and um, and and that you know that, that they listened to me, that they cared about where I was at, besides just with assignments. And and those are the ones that that I, I still remember them. I have very fond memories of them. You know, even if most of my memories of them are you know teaching me math or something. Um, but you know, people they want to be heard. They want to know that you care and that you're not coming at them with an agenda. And um, and so the more you listen and and uh, just you know try to figure out um, where they're coming from and, and try to you know develop a fuller picture of of who people are, um, the better you're going to be able to connect with them. All right, and, and it's just this goes back to you know so much of this stuff is goes back to the stuff that we talked about before, like don't treat people like merit badges and. Um, you know, and, and just and just love people, and then love them some more, and love them some more, and um, and and uh, well, actually, there's uh, I'll let you know next month is uh, is sort of a review, but at the same there will be new stuff too, and um, and there's a, a recent study that we'll get into next month that talks about uh, some of this stuff um, about connecting with people, what people. Uh, respond to and what they don't and stuff like that and so we'll get to that just a little preview of that um so all right um find out why and i already talked about this the um when when people are you know feel a certain way or, or react a certain way or believe a certain thing why you know where does that come from and um it's amazing how much our experiences can affect uh the way that we see the world um, I mean, that's, that's how we, that's how we think, it's how we learn, it's how we process, is through experience, right? And, and most of our learning is nonverbal. And, um, and, and so, you know, we, we experience through, um, you know, just through, through our relationships and, and connections, uh, and things like that. And, um. And if, if a person has a, a negative experience in one area, that can drastically affect just their whole view of that area. Um, and, and, and if they have a positive experience in something that maybe that is not the best for them, all right, they're still going to be drawn to that. And um, so, yeah, you get to know better. The next thing is meet a need. Um, if, you can, if you can help a person out, um, and just, you know, this goes back to love them, all right? Find out what people need and, um, and be there for them. And, and don't, don't, be, uh, don't be too quick to sort of immediately look for that opportunity to, you know, hi, I'm, I'm Dale. Is Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? You know, I mean, not only get to know them, but... Um, Remember, Jesus is, God is love. Jesus is all about love, all right? And if people learn more from their experiences than, from, uh, than verbally, then they're going to experience that love best through, um, through seeing it in action, all right? Because the reality is, is that, that love, real love is harder and harder to come by, and especially the kind of love that God's talking about, all right? And, um... And it's, you know, nowadays with, with social media and stuff, so many of our relationships can be very shallow and sort of pick and choose and, and things like that, that, um, that to, to have somebody that is going to be there for you and, um, and will be there through thick and thin, a, a real true friend, uh, what I like to refer to as the person that you can call at 2 a.m., um, boy, those people are really hard to come by. And... Um, and, and so if, if a person can get a sense from you that you actually really care about them and you're there for them and, and um, you know, to the point of, of looking for those needs and, and offering to meet those needs, um, uh, to, to the point of, um, <coughs> as you're listening, that you're listening for those needs. And, and there's a big difference between Huh, let me know if there's something I can do for you. And would you mind if I do this for you? 
Um, you'll see that with uh, where a family goes through a crisis or something like that, medical situation or whatever, and, and people go, well, you know, let me know what I can do for you. Well, they don't want to ask. They don't want to, you know, they know, yeah, they would do it for me, but I don't want to put them out and, you know, and stuff. But if you say, hey, can I, you know, bring you a hot dish or, or can I, do you need, are the people who need rides somewhere or something like that, I would be happy to do that. You know, then, you know, and as you, and the more you listen, the more aware you are of what those needs are. And, um, and then you can, then you can really say, yeah, I'm here for you. All right. And ask more than once too. Um, because sometimes people, I mean, just being concrete like that is really helpful, but, um, but sort of taking that next step because people might go, no, I, I no, it's okay. And, um, or, or like, oh, we're okay right now, you know? But then even whether it's, you know, maybe a couple days later to, to say, hey, I know I asked you this, you said it was okay, but I know sometimes things change and, um, you know, do you still, I would still, I, I'd be happy to do this for you. I'd be happy to do that for you, you know, or, or whatever. And, um, and to, you know, to, to demonstrate that because sometimes, you know, maybe someone says, hey, I'd like to do this. And you go, no, I'm actually, I'm good right now. And then like, mm -hmm. Something changes. You know, oh, I shouldn't have said no. But then they feel bad about saying, you know, asking because they already said no. So by you know, just by making yourself available to them, right? And that's that that sacrificial love that God shows to us uh, to say, look, I am willing to to give up myself to however I can for you uh, because of the love that God has shown to me. Uh, you know, then they they really they experience that and. Um, and helps them to see uh, that it's real. Uh, um, oh, <laughs> uh, respond to pain with love. Um, just to let people know that you're there for them. Or for one, don't uh, just try to fix things. Um, be be there to. To, um, to help how you can, but especially be there to listen. And, um, and, and then this, this stuff kind of ties together. Uh, be authentic. Um, okay, what does that mean? Um, just don't, don't try to be something you're not. Um, don't, uh, especially when if somebody that you don't know very well, um, we try to, to impress people. It's just kind of naturally we want to demonstrate that, that we're a person, a worthwhile person to, to get to know or whatever. Um, uh, I, I know, especially if you're working with, uh, talking to, um, to youth and that, that, you know, trying to be cool or, or something like that can be a tendency. And, um, but, I mean, people can see through that stuff. And, um, and, and they don't need you to be you know, the, the funniest person in the room or, or whatever. Um, just be you. And, um, and, and, and be honest about where you're at too. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, people are, are struggling with stuff, um, be honest about, oh yeah, I know what that's like. Um, not that you necessarily, or don't, don't say, um, I know what that's like is probably the, the wrong way to say it, all right? But, but you might say something, I've, I've had that same kind of feeling, all right? Um, because you might have very different situations that have the same kinds of feelings associated with them. And so maybe, you, you know, saying, yeah, been there, done that, all right? No, you haven't because it's different for everyone, all right? But if you say, wow, how did that feel? Or, you know, how, how, that must have been frustrating or, or something like that. Oh, yeah, you know, because you can't say, I've been frustrated like that. All right? So we can share, have, have feelings as a common, uh, something in common, um, where we don't actually have experiences in common. Because even if someone went through what seems like exactly the same thing, all right, they went through it with a completely different set of experiences um, that they brought into that situation. 
And so therefore, no, their experience was completely different from yours. But the feelings may have been very similar. Um, and that gets back to listening. Uh, you know, how did you feel? All right, um, be present. This is something that, um, that I love, you know, when um, Moses is talking to God in the burning bush and, and God says, go and, and set my people free. And, um, and he says, oh, what God should I tell them is uh, sent me? And he said, I am that I am, or um, depending on how it's translated, tell them I am sent you. Right? And um, in, in English, we, we tend to hear that and say, oh, I am, as in like, he is the only real God. He's the only God who actually exists. All right? But in Hebrew, the verb to be is not a passive verb, it's an active verb. And, um, and it's, it's really, better translation is, but it just kind of doesn't flow well in English. It would be like, I'm happening. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, you see sometimes uh, things like, like, and it came to pass, you know, or depending on the, what translation you use. Um, but it's, and it happened, right? It's not just it was, it happened, right? It's an active, ongoing thing. And so, um, you know, when God emphasizes, I am, right? He's saying, I am happening among you. I am I'm doing something. I'm actively involved, right? And, um, and, and so this is, Again, when so many of our connections nowadays are electronic and distance and, and uh, sort of not, not face-to-face, there is no substitute for face-to-face, right? And if you can't be face-to-face, a phone call is better than, uh, than a text. And, and I mean, I know that I'm easier to get a hold of with text than phone calls just because um, I can, if I'm in the middle of something, I can get back to you easier and, um, and you know, and things like that. And, or if I'm at home and things are noisy, <laughs> then eh, I'm going to have to, if I'm in the middle of something, I'm, I'm going to have to wait. But if I see that text, then I can quick respond even if things are still noisy, right? But at the same time, being able to connect with people face-to-face is completely different, right? And we need that. We need to be together with people. We were made for that. We were made in God's image. God is, in and of himself, community because he's the trinity. And, and so we need that community. And so the closer our connections with each other, the more we're able to, to get back to what we lost in the fall. And, um, and so to be present is to, to actually spend time with people. And we'll get to that a little bit more later in another section. Um, but, but being there with, not just for people, but with people. Um, and just spending time and, and I know for me, this is, this is a struggle because I tend to be task oriented. And, and so, um, I think, you know, I, I could be talking to someone really enjoying the conversation, but at the same time in the back of my head, I've got all these things I need to get done. You know, I mean, I could, I could be out with friends at a restaurant, you know, eating burgers. And, and this is like the first night I've gotten out just, you know, for in, in three months and still in the back of my head, it's going, yeah, you got all this stuff you need to get done. All right, we need to cut this short. <laughs> and no, and then I have to tell myself, you know, consciously, no, I need this. <laughs> All right. And so, um, so, so yeah, be present and, and ask questions. This kind of ties back to the beginning. Um, ask questions, ask more questions. You notice that, that Jesus, you look at his ministry and the way that he connected with people. He asked a whole lot more questions than he actually made statements. Right? When he's connecting with people, right, he would just keep asking questions. And, and people would ask him questions and he'd answer with a question. Right? But they would learn through those questions. He was questions and stories. Like that was that was probably 90% of his ministry. I pulled that number out of the air, so don't, you know, check me on that. But um but but yeah, you know. Ask questions. Ask where people are coming from. Um, you know, ask. And, and, and my favorite question from seminary was, why do you want to know? 
All right, so I'm going to ask you a question. Why do you want to know? You know, because sometimes the answer is different depending on where they're coming from. Especially if they're asking what you believe something about God. Right? Because, um, <clears throat> if, you know, you, once you, you find out kind of the background to that question, I mean, boy, when, when people walk in here off the street and go, what do you believe? <laughs> wow, that's a really loaded question. Why, you know, why do you ask her, what's your, you know, what's your experience or where are you coming from with that question? Because otherwise, what I say to you may be completely misinterpreted because of the, the sort of baggage that comes along with the experience, not baggage in a negative sense necessarily, but just the experience that, that comes behind that question. Um, you know, maybe they got burned somewhere else and, and they might misinterpret because they're expecting the same thing. And, um, and, and so, you know, are you know, okay, where are you coming from? What's your experience been so that, so that I understand why are you asking that question? Or as, as one of our professors used to say, what's the question behind the question? What are you really actually asking? And, um, and so the more you can, you know, sort of draw that out and see where a person's coming from, then you cannot, and I'm not talking about, you know, spin. I'm I'm talking about um, actually getting to the heart of what are you actually asking so that what I say actually has something to do with what you want to know Uh, instead of going off. I mean, I've done this so many times where I've just, I've gone off on a completely different direction from what the person was asking um, just because I wasn't, I I didn't ask those preliminary questions. I, I haven't didn't first figure out where they're coming from and why they're asking it. I mean, to the point that sometimes I've given a completely wrong answer and um, because I didn't know why they were asking. Um, right. So um, <clears throat> when we get into... The, um, the this actual question of um, of connecting with people and what to tell them. Um, Ever wondered why Jesus' last command to his committed followers was to make disciples of all nations? Have you ever wondered what it would look like if Christ's most committed followers today actually carried forth that command according to the standards set forth in the New Testament by Christ and the Twelve? If an evangelist were to reach a thousand people a day for Christ in a frozen population rate, can you imagine how long it would take to reach the world for Jesus Christ? Just over 15,000 years. And imagine the spiritual maturity of these new converts, most of whom receive no real follow-up or discipleship and end up never reaching their full potential in Christ. However, If a committed follower of Christ, we'll call him Paul, were to disciple a new believer for one year, we'll call him Timothy. To the extent that Timothy matures in Christ until he is able to disciple another. For as Luke 6.40 says, the student will become like his teacher. So then, in year two, Timothy has become a disciple himself and takes on his first student, while Paul takes on another student. By the third year, our Paul is discipling his third student, while our Timothy is discipling his second student, and our newest student is now able to make disciples as well. If the cycle is not broken, a spiritual downline is created which multiplies to the ends of the earth. Even at an accurate and growing population rate, do you know how long it would take in such a scenario to reach the entire world for Jesus Christ? Just under 37 years. And now imagine the spiritual maturity of these believers, all of whom have been equipped to both be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. This is why Christ's last command to his followers is not to make converts, but to make disciples of all nations. All right. I know I talked about this in previous, uh, in previous sessions, all right, but I have to emphasize it. And that is uh, when Jesus in the Great Commission, and this is, and I have to emphasize this because I had this wrong for the first mm, 11, 12 years of my ministry, right? Um, and you'd think that with seminary training and everything that 
kind of get this, right? That, that Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the end. Right? Teaching them, not teaching them everything I've commanded you, but teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Teaching them to treasure everything I've commanded you. Teaching them, and the word here is, is keep, to, to, to cling to, to, to go, yes, I need this. This is wonderful. This is what I need above all else. Right? And so it's not about, you know, that's why it's not about merit badges, right? It's about disciples. Um, I'm actually, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm excited about the new Star Wars movie coming out. Well, if you know me, you know that's true. But, um, <laughs> but, but one of the things that, um, that I'm excited about is uh, I've seen some, some theories about why the, the new, new movie is called The Rise of, or, uh, the Rise of Skywalker. And because in the last movie, he said, the Jedis have to end. No more Jedis. And then, like, well, we know that that's, you know, what, what does that mean? And, um, and, but the Star Wars movies are one of the best examples in modern times of discipleship that you'll find. Right? Because you have, you have Luke going and hanging out with Yoda and Dagobah. All right, and he's trying all this different stuff, and he's doing these things that don't always make sense. But he's like, "All right, just do it." All right, and and you know, and he tries and he fails, and and he, and he tries again, and he, he finds himself in difficult situations. All right, and um, and and he's got to and he's got to learn from those situations and stuff. But Yoda's kind of always there, you know, kind of guiding him and directing him and kind of nudging him in different directions and, and things like that. And and we see that example. Over and over, they've got their 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 padawans and their um, you know and, and and all this kind of stuff. These different okay, well you're not you're not quite ready yet, you know, to go out there and all that. And and while you know the the church isn't quite so um, uh, structured with with tests before you take the next step and, and things like that. Um, at the same time, to to actually have that growth and and to to be able to um, to to, well, to actually grow, um, to learn not only, I mean, you think about with parents, if, um, if we always spoon fed our kids everything, right, and then and never actually taught them to pick up the spoon and, and eat with it, right, that would be terrible for them, right? And, and it's, it's not often that I would say that someone failed as a parent because we all do in various ways, all right? But if you refuse to let your kid ever use, learn to use a spoon when there's no sort of disabilities or anything that are keeping them from it, all right, then you failed as a parent, all right? They need to learn to take care of themselves, all right? And so, um, and, and the same is true with spiritual parenting. That if we always spoon feed everything to people and don't teach them how to feed themselves and then in turn to feed others, then we're kind of failing. So we need to learn not only how to, you know, we, we first learn how to consume God's blessings, right? Then we, we need to, at some point, learn how to, how to actually feed ourselves, right? And that's kind of the whole point of, of the last, last uh, month's session, was feeding yourself, right? Um, and, but then also learning how to feed others and, um, and helping them see how this works and, and, and how this grows. And, and that's the point. And, um, and, and so, so part of, of our necessary growth is learning how to help others grow. So, so make disciples, not converts. Disciple is not, I mean, the, the translation of the word disciple um, is literally a learner, all right? But, but if you look at it, and, you know, we sort of, when we hear learner, we have a tendency to think pupil, 
classroom, sitting in rows, all right, sitting listening. So whether it's in a classroom or a sanctuary, you have one person standing up in front talking and everyone else just sits there, maybe takes notes, maybe not. Um, hopefully learn something along the way. Hopefully get something that is helpful to them, right? But when you're, when it's daily life and, and you're connecting with people um, in daily life and, and dealing with stuff as it comes, that's what making disciples is. So, um, and it's, you know, this is, this is what I say, the, the, um, the most common uh, disciple makers are parents, right? Um, and uh, and, and, and I, I definitely think that we need to, um, to do a better job of helping parents figure out how to do this um, because some parents really want to and just don't know how. Um, I, 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 didn't, <laughs> I didn't think I knew how until my kids were old enough that I looked at them and went, oh, <laughs> I guess I did. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it, and then I, I looked back on it and went, what did I do? And, um, and, and I could see, you know, some of the things that, that I learned from my parents and other things I picked up along the way and, and, and stuff. And, you know, between my wife and me, the, um, but we can also look back and, and see the things that we didn't do well. Um, and, and said, boy, really should have been more intentional about this and that and, um, that we weren't and, and that it would have been better. And, and I can even see some of my own weaknesses in my kids where maybe there's an area that, that I struggle with. I'm not as strong spiritually. And then, and I see that they've got that same thing because I didn't, I didn't really have that I needed to grow more in that and so therefore I wasn't able to teach them as well and um, so but okay here's the other thing that none of us actually is Jesus and so none of us are gonna do it perfectly right and that's the beauty of the body of Christ is that it's not actually on any one of us all right it's, this is a collective thing. And, uh, and collectively, we're not perfect either. Right? But we can fill in each other's weaknesses with our strengths. Um, all right. Uh, next thing is meet people where they're at. Um, <laughs> the, the first time I heard this expression was... Um, when I was on Vicarage, I may have told you the story, stop me if I have. Um, I, I found out, I was teaching fifth and sixth grade confirmation class, and I found out that um, the kids were saying, uh, I was saying, you know, really simple way to, to share your faith in school is to just carry a Bible. And, um, you know, if you have like silent reading time or something like that, pick it up and read it. That's good for you, and, and it also, just in a very simple, not pushy way, is a way to, um, for you to express your faith and what's important to you. And they say, oh, we can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Oh, yeah, no, if, if we bring a Bible to school, we'll, we'll end up in, in detention. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's our system principal said that. No, and I mean, and they're all going, oh, yeah. I said, okay, you guys have the constitutional right to take your Bibles with you. As long as you're respectful of your teachers, you're using it at appropriate times and stuff, you take your Bibles. Like, no, like, we'll get detention. We'll miss the bus. Stay after school. We'll miss the bus. You know, I said, if you get detention for taking your Bible to school, as long as you were being respectful and, and that, I will pick you up and take you home afterward. You call me. All right? And so, so the next day I get this angry phone call from a parent. <laughs> Saying, what did you tell my kid? What, 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 what's going on? Well, as they were getting on the bus this morning, they said, oh, by the way, mom, we might not be on the bus coming home. <laughs> <laughs> what I neglected to say, make sure you talk to your parents about this first. <laughs> oh, I know, I <laughs> 
<laughs> so my vicars are not pastors. Um, and I had a, my supervising pastor was there to kind of help, you know, cover for me um, and explain, you know. But, uh, you know, when I talked to her, though, I said, well, you know, but this is important and, and, and stuff. And, and she's like, well, you know, other schooling is important, too. And, you know, and I was kind of trying to push my emphasis and, and stuff. And, and, and this parent not only, you know, was upset about the whole sort of not talking to them first, but, but just that, you know, that I was kind of pushing the kids in a direction that the parent wasn't quite comfortable yet. I mean, that same day, I got a call from another parent. To say, hey, I want to thank you for that because I actually went down to the school and talked to the assistant principal and straightened him out. <laughs> so it was never a problem again. It actually worked out. But um, but this one parent, my supervising pastor said, you got to meet people where they're at. All right, you can't you can't just you know push people in a direction that they're not ready to go. And um, and and so. Here's the thing, meeting people where they're at, it worked really well for Jesus. And I think I might have said this in an earlier class. But when I look at the people that Jesus hung out with, right, the people who, um, who were marginalized for specifically for either what was or what was perceived as a sinful lifestyle. These people hung out with Jesus and loved Jesus. Jesus never compromised when it came to talking about sin. And yet, they loved hanging out with this guy. Right? If we, if that's not true today, then we're doing something wrong. And we're clearly not doing it like Jesus. Right? Because he met people where they were at. Whatever their situation was, you're a tax collector. You, you sold out your whole country, right? You aligned yourself with the invading, occupying force and are cashing in against your fellow, your, your, you know, your countrymen um, and, and ripping them off to give money to this occupying, invading force and, and, you're, and you're getting rich off of it, Right? Jesus hung out with these guys. Right? And, and the list goes on of all of the, the, the sinful people. Right? And they loved him. They thought he was great, and he didn't pull his punches. Because they knew that he loved them. Because they knew that, I mean, here's the thing. People that are... Um, that are, you know, in whether it's a, a, a lifestyle or an action that's perceived as sinful, whether they even believe it is or not, and whether it is or not, or if it's just been communicated that way, right? They've already heard the law. Either it's come from within them and they know their own struggles with it, right? Or someone's already communicated it to them. All right, no doubt in my mind. All right, now, there's exceptions, but for the most part, they've heard the law. What they haven't heard is the gospel. What they haven't heard is, okay, God loves you, and I love you. All right, and and how what I think of you and how I. Um, how I value you and how God values you has absolutely nothing to do with that. Because it's not about what kind of sheep you are, it's about what kind of shepherd he is. All right? And we all have our struggles and hang-ups. And then and when we start to look at what sin is all about, like what, why does, you know, God hate sin? Right? Why? Because he loves us. And he knows that sin drives wedges in between us. And he doesn't want those wedges. All right? Yeah, he gets angry about sin. But he doesn't get angry at us. 
He gets angry about all of those things that are getting in the way of us having the perfect relationship that he wants for us. Right? It all goes back to his love. And, and if the way that you talk about sin comes across as condemnation of a person instead of God loves you and, and what he wants for you is to know his love, then, I mean, you're just not, you're not going to make that connection. And unfortunately, so often, the church has, has tried really hard to speak the truth and forgot to do it in love. And, um, or, or else there's a tendency to, to speak love and, and, and not truth and, and compromise. Jesus didn't do that. Right? But if you get back to it, if you start with, I love you. I mean, that's, that's how God did it when he introduced the Ten Commandments. Right? He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Right? I already saved you. You're already saved. Right? Therefore. And then he goes into what we call the Ten Commandments. Right? So it's not, your salvation is dependent on these things. On you jumping through these hoops. It is, I've already saved you. Right? Don't enslave yourselves again. What he wants for us is freedom. Uh, I just yesterday, on Facebook, one of my atheist friends, uh, you know, had this, this picture, and it was, it showed a bunch of people walking with umbrellas, and real, like, somber, and it was, it was raining inside the umbrella. All right, so like all the rain was coming from the umbrella. And then there was one person that, had, that had like sort of closed the umbrella and, and set it down and went, huh, it's not raining. And the caption was, what it feels like to come out of your religion. And I went, oh. And I just, and, and my, my, my immediate thought was, wow, if your religion feels like that, that is absolutely true. All right? But that's not the gospel. If the gospel feels like that, that's not the gospel. And, um, but, I mean, for a lot of people, that's been their experience. But, man, we've got the gospel. And it's amazing. And it's wonderful. And it's all about God's love, not about jumping through hoops and a bunch of rules. That's what the Pharisees did, by the way. <clears throat> All right? I think we talked about this before, right? But I'm going to, this is one of those things that needs to be reminded and emphasized. Um, is, all right, belong, believe, behave. That, you know, Jesus' disciples, they belonged before they believed. All right? Along the line, they, they believed that he was the Messiah, but they still didn't get what that meant. All right? And, when, and when, when push came to shove, they didn't behave either. All right? And we'll see that nice and clear this week. All right? Because we've got, I mean, you know, when, when it comes right down to it, do you really believe it? They all abandon him. Everyone. And... And yet he still claimed them. They still belong as far as he was concerned. Right? We need to let people belong before they believe. Before their lives change. And I, I know I've gotten into trouble saying this, but like behaving is just not a big um, priority for me. Right? Um, because the Holy Spirit produces that, produces the, that response. Now, if someone wants to know, okay, how, you know, how do I get the most out of, uh, you know, out of God's love? And how do I, you know, how do I experience that more fully and stuff like that? I, I can talk about spiritual discipline. I can talk about, you know, God's law and, and, and how he uses that to actually set us free. Right, from all the sins that would that would enslave us. Okay. But 
until you're actually free, then those things really don't matter. And, um, and so, but we can be so quick to, to see someone's behavior or they're, you know, seeing things um, in a way that, that we disagree with. And so often it's, uh, it's so often it's not even, um, it's, it's, it's not even biblical. I mean, as much as Jesus got on the Pharisees about all these man-made rules, man, the Christian church is just rife with them. Right? And I mean, I've had, I had plenty of people that have gotten on my case about, you know, having the proper liturgy and um, having, you know, I mean, you, you see through all the church's history and rules about dancing and, um, you know, and I mean, you know, the list goes on. And, um, you know, we, we talked before about jargon and, and all that kind of stuff. And, boy, it's so easy to add rules. We like rules. They give us order and structure. And, and as long as, you know, and this is the whole thing. Okay, so if you are a slave and have no freedom whatsoever, then you have security. I, you know, everything depends on what somebody else uh, is, you know, they're, they're making the rules. So if things fall apart, it's on them, not me. Right? Jesus comes and he sets us free. And he goes, oh, so what should I do? Whatever you want. You're free. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Then that means that like, I have to make my own decisions. <laughs> yes. You can. And, and when you mess up, there's forgiveness. And, and God still loves you. And, and it's a wild ride. But it can be scary sometimes. <clears throat> but if you know that, you know, that Jesus is there and, 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 you know, he's got you the whole way, then, then it's, it's not scary, it's just exciting. And it means that you can take risks and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So that all, that all ties in with that. Mom, where's Timmy? He's gone to be with the Lord. He's dead? No, silly. He and his family have moved to Bubble Creek Canyon. <laughs> Do you dream of a day when you can drive to work without being forced to look at unchristian billboards and bumper stickers? When you can turn on the radio without hearing the electric guitar or some of the horrible instrument of the devil? When you don't have to interact with bozos who have the audacity to disagree with you? Well, at Bobo Creek Canyon, your dreams can come true. Hello. Or as we like to say at Bobo Creek Canyon, heaven out. Bobo Creek Canyon is an isolated community and has only 3,500 acres of magnificent and desirable real estate. Best of all, it's 100% heat and free. That's right, and you'll think it's the next best thing to have it. At Bubba Creek Canyon, we use an elaborate screening process to ensure that our residents completely agree with our doctrine. The <laughs> gifts hands are Buddhists. We're a heavily gated community with fantastic facilities, breathtaking sight lines, and Christianized amenities. We have a Christian shoe store, a Christian t-shirt store, a Christian underwear store, a Christian bank, Christian grocery, Christian car dealership, Christian pet store, Christian liquor store, and a Christian tattoo parlor. <laughs> Temporary, of course. We have a nationally recognized school district and only one textbook. We also think you're going to like our library. Let this filth get in here. <laughs> At the BCC Cinema, you can watch all the latest movies without worrying about the questionable content because we removed it all. Every home comes with a spacious backyard with plenty of room for an optional baptism pool. Hey! Pin the ear on the High Priest Soldier, one of my personal favorites. And each home comes equipped with built-in Christian signage. Just try to pull this off the wall. With our combination cable and internet package, you'll have access to ES Pray N, My Heavenly Space, God Tunes, Godopedia, God Gold, God Bay, Godcast, and The Sopranos. 
Every morning, a copy of our community paper will be delivered to your doorstep. That publication is committed to protecting you from all that unpalatable bad news that's always happening around the world. Our landscape and company holy ground will make sure that your front yard is always impeccably manicured. We've added a new feature this year. Around the holidays, special sensors in the streetlights detect non-nativity ornamentation and act quickly to eliminate these unsightly eyesores. Bubble Creek Canyon. If God wasn't omnipresent, he'd probably live here. <laughs> oh, it's funny because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is, you know, we can get so comfortable in our immediate surroundings um, that it's uncomfortable to step outside, right? Um, you can actually, they've done studies on uh, Christians that the longer you're a Christian, the less non Christian friends you have. And because, I mean, because like attracts likes. Like, right? You know, we, we, we tend to. to <clears throat> find and surround ourselves with people that are like us, that see things the same way that we do, that enjoy the same uh, sort of hobbies, TV shows, movies, you know, whatever it is. I mean, that's who we surround ourselves with, because people that we can identify with, right? Well, I mean, for a Christian who completely sees your, um, you know, that sort of everything is centered in the gospel, for someone who has no concept of that, and see things completely different to that, that can make things challenging, right? Which can lead us, you know, back to getting hung up on behavior and and but even believing. Um, and these these kind of two things tied together uh, remind me. I just have a couple of examples. Um, we had um, a few years back. I was uh, just before uh, we came here, actually. We had a foster son uh, who was uh, 16, uh, turned 17 while he was with us. Um, now, normally, if we our rules were uh, we don't take anyone who's um, who's older than Hannah. Uh, that was kind of our like. If she gets older, we'll take you know anyone younger than her because because we already have experience with that age. All right. Um, well, they they called us up and said you know we've got this boy and. We have literally nowhere else. I mean, if, if, if you guys can't take him, we're going to have to probably send him out of state. And, um, and we said, all right, we'll, we'll take him until you can find uh, someone else. Um, just a t temporary. Well, he was with us for 18 months, so it um, wasn't real temporary. Um, and, uh, but while he was with us, and, and he was not a Christian, Right. Um, we we brought him to church, and he kept coming, and he didn't really fight us on it. I mean, like we couldn't force him to go. We just said, "Hey, we're going to church." And, okay, and uh, but but then I also had a, a small uh, men's group. Um, they would get together on Sunday nights, and um, and and it was uh, you know mostly I was. I was probably age-wise in the middle. A couple guys that were younger than me, a couple guys that were older than me. And um, and I said, hey, you want to come? Just check it out. You know, try it once. If you don't, if you don't want to come after that, fine. All right? Um, he kept coming back. He started inviting his friends to come. And they went, you don't believe this stuff. Why do you go? And we thought he was just going because, like, there was food served. And he was a teenage boy. Um, he said, it's nice to belong to something. Mm -hmm. Ha ha. Right? He kept coming back, and he was studying the Bible, and, you know, and, and, and we, would, we had these, these questions where um, each week where you kind of go through as kind of a short summary of the Ten Commandments and, you know, how you doing and where are your struggles and all this kind of stuff. And, man, he was he was in this whole thing. Even one day he says, hey, so we're reading this, you know, chapter of, of Matthew this week. Is it okay if I read ahead? I said, no. 
No, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was actually to the point that, that we could use this as, you say, you know, can I, can I go? Or are we going or whatever? And, and say, okay, you can only go if you got your homework done this weekend. <laughs> Which is, I really hated to do that, all right? <laughs> but it actually worked. <laughs> Right, and for for a non-Christian kid to want to go to um, to an adult men's Bible study, right, because he was accepted there, he was one of the guys, right, and there was no there was no barrier for entry, anyone was welcome, and you're welcome wherever you were at, and and it was okay. Um. Another uh, uh, another story with this this whole idea um, is uh, well, just our um, our Wednesday night youth group, right? A lot of the kids that are coming are are not Christians, um, but they feel accepted here. This is one of the this is, for a lot of them. This is the only place where they can go, where they're just completely welcomed and accepted, and and not judged. And, um, and, and they can, they can, you know, they're open and honest about their, their situations, their hangups, their, um, their home life, whatever it is, right? Their, their struggles, right? And, but, and because we have an environment of, yeah, we all have struggles. We're here for you. We're here with you. We're, we're all in this together. Mm-hmm. They keep coming back and they keep inviting their friends, right? I remember one that um, they brought his friend and and I was there. They're sitting right back at the table back there, and um, and I was just kind of walking past the table and I heard I heard the one say to, to his friend that he brought, "This is the best place ever." Mm-hmm. And I went to hear uh, uh, you know someone who was he, he actually was uh, graduated from high school, but he was still coming and. Um, and to hear him say that, um, where where he had uh, he'd actually been essentially kicked out of his lab, the, the church that he'd grown up in because he showed up with a bunch of heavy metal patches on his jacket. <laughs> he came here, and I went, "Oh, Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne, and Ronnie James Dio," and and like his jaw just dropped, <laughs> and. Um, and you know, you figure out, oh, oh, like I'm actually welcome here. And man, just to 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 have an environment, and, and so for us to you know to be able to 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 react to respond to people in that kind of way, that I, my the way I care about you is not dependent on on your action, right, or your worldview. Whatever I value you as a person because God values you as a person because you're of infinite value. Um, uh, one more example, no, two more examples. Right? Um, when I was in college, uh, on Friday and Saturday nights, I hung out with a bunch of role players, um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff like that, and um, and uh, this is a group was called Rusap, the Royal Order of Strange Acting People. And um, and we'd hang out at the, at the student union, and um, and one night we're we're I'm, I'm in this room, and I mean there's like a couple dozen people in there, and and I hear there's this conversation that starts up about all oh, these BACs, oh Hanson BACs, uh, you know, and, and I'm like, what do you, what do you guys have? What BACs? Born again Christians. Hey, <laughs> wait wait a minute. I mean, do you guys know the that I'm a Christian, and I said, well, yeah, but you're cool. Oh, oh, because I welcomed and accepted them, I care about them, and treat them as people, All right? And they'd had some really negative, like, it was like, like the whole room had had these negative experiences um, that just completely turned them off to anything having to do with Christianity. And I mean, I was, for most of them, I was like the only person in their lives that was a Christian that wanted to be friends with them. I went, man, that is so broken. Um, 
Uh, one more, and, and this is a friend of mine uh, from uh, from high school that um, she was not a Christian. And actually, had uh, Christianity kind of used against her um, by her mom. She, you know, church was punishment and things like that. Um, she, uh, but I mean, we were good friends, and um, and and one, I remember one time she said to me, "Okay, well, I'm not a Christian, but if I were a Christian, I'd want to be Lutheran." She said, because you're a Lutheran, and I'd want to be a Christian like you. Oh. Well, it's not because not it's like I have everything all figured out, but just because I welcomed her and, you know, and, and just like treated her like a human being. <coughs> um, a number of years later, we kind of lost touch, and, um, and then one, one day I, I got a phone call from her saying, will you baptize me? Mm. What? <laughs> and, um, and she had, she'd gone through uh, quite a bit of stuff, but uh, you know, she met a guy who was a Christian. And, um, and then and through him, and from her previous experience with me and hopefully a few others, um, and, you know, and, and with him that, well, long story short, she now teaches Sunday school. Um, so this this whole stepping outside thing um, ties in with the next piece, and that is remember that works aren't the goal; freedom is. Right? Um, if we we want people to be free. Um, <laughs> So the, I, I, I heard, uh, by the way, if, you, if you're interested in a little entertainment uh, this weekend, um, oh wait, maybe it was last weekend, maybe you missed it. Um, the, the Westboro Baptist Church was in town. Not, not here in West St. Paul, but I think here in like Burnsville or something like that. Um, they, they're protesting a bunch of churches because they celebrate Easter. Um, because it's pagan. Best I can figure out is just because they call it Easter and not, you know, resurrection or something like that. But I, I don't know. But <laughs> um, I, I, you know, we can. Well, that's like goofy and and like okay. Well, those guys are way out there. Um, it's so easy to get hung up on this whole behavior thing. Um, where to, God wants us to be free. And, um, and to know that we're forgiven, to know that we're accepted unconditionally by him. Right? That's what he wants us to know. Right? Everything else comes after that. And, um, and so it's, you know, it, it can be really easy to, you know, to go, well, if that person's a Christian, how come they're not, you know, in church on Sundays or, or whatever, you know? Different people, where they're at. Um, you know, we, I think we talked about this last time that worship is the means to an end; it's not the end, right? Um, and but that that goes with anything that we sort of think of as Christian living. Um, all those things are means to an end; they're means to experiencing God's freedom in a greater way. Um, but those things are not the goal. The goal is freedom. Um, and babies are not little adults, right? When, when people start to, um, to see maybe there's something to this whole Christianity thing, um, we can't expect that all of a sudden they're going to act like fully mature Christian. I mean, I don't always act like a fully mature Christian. <laughs> Depending who you talk to, I rarely act like a fully mature Christian, right? But to you know, to expect that they're going to have, you know, they're going to memorize the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and, and be familiar with the Athanasian Creed and you know, <laughs> and 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 know all the 
the seasons of the church here and, you know, and, or whatever, and, or, or just to, that all of a sudden uh, I was just, just today, um, I think on the way here, uh, I was listening to a, a podcast and it was a, a pastor talking about a, a guy who was a greeter at their church and he was kind of a new Christian. And, um, and he said, said, yeah, it took about six to nine months to, um, to, to get him to stop using profanity when he was greeting people at church. <laughs> hey, how the, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and we can look at that and laugh. And, we, we, and, and, and he said, you know, I, I took a risk as a pastor by letting this guy do this. And, you know, we talked to him and stuff, but like, he, like, it was just, he wasn't used to not using profanity. And, um, and so he was just being himself. And uh, it put people off, <laughs> which you might expect. And yet, this is a guy that was excited. He loved Jesus. He wanted other people to know Jesus. He was really happy to, you know, to just be in a community of believers, you know, and, and stuff. And so he let him greet people. And um, and and you know what? I I agree. I'd rather have someone that was a bit coarse in their language, that was welcoming and, and loving people, and, um, and, and, and expressing that kind of love, than someone who dots all their I's and crosses all their T's properly, and judges anyone who doesn't. Because who's going to make you feel more welcome? Who's going to make you want to come back? All right? It also means living sacrificially. You get messy. Uh, love is messy. Uh, and things don't always go the way we'd like them to. And, and they don't always, I mean, uh, it, it takes time. And, uh, and, and you gotta, you got to build trust with people. And, and, and people, even when you see someone that's starting to kind of move in a, in a a good direction, and then, um, and then all of a sudden things are not going in that direction anymore. Um, that's that's the way love works. Is you're there for them, and you, it always goes back to you're not my project. You're you're this person that, that God dearly loves and wants to know His love. Churches are full of people, the broken, the lonely, the wanderers, the hopeful, the enthusiastic, the lost, the passionate, and the faithful. For many, this gathering represents the whole of their church experience. They'll listen attentively to a message, they'll sing a few songs, they'll be invited to pray, and then they'll return to their lives. But for some, questions will start bubbling to the surface of their faith. Is this the extent of what Jesus intended for his followers? Who is the church for? Why does the world need the church, and what is the church after all? Well, the church isn't the building where people attend weekly services. It's not a program, a list of rules, or a philosophy. The church isn't a political affiliation, a country club, or a holiday tradition. The church was never intended to be just an assembly of people wearing nice clothes and saying nice things. The church is all the followers of Jesus everywhere. The Greek word for church is the word ekklesia. It's the combination of two words, ek, which means out, and kaleo, meaning called. Thus, the church, the ecclesia, means the called out ones. In other words, the church, the collective body of all the followers of Jesus everywhere, is called out by someone for something, for a purpose. The beginning of the book of Acts has Jesus calling his disciples to a task, bringing something called the gospel, the good news, to all the world. And this gospel would go out to all the outsiders, the forgotten, the abandoned, and the excluded. And they, those outsiders, would see and receive that good news as actually good. When Jesus talked about the gospel, it was always in conjunction with something else, something called the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, God's purposes are made apparent. There's justice and righteousness. There's hope for the poor and for the oppressed. And under the kingdom of God, mercy and forgiveness take precedence over bitterness and resentment. Now, people previously deemed to be far from God are brought into his family, adopted as his sons and daughters. 
And the fullness of the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, is not merely expressed as a way for people to escape an evil world when they die. Rather, the good news of God's kingdom is about the announcement of God's eternity moving into the present world and carrying on into the life to come. The people who belong to Jesus join in in his worldwide restoration project. And the called out ones, the church, are committed to advancing this good news of God's kingdom into the world. Not as a means of helping people avoid the world, but rather to see God's kingdom life being made real here and now. The whole church, with the power of the whole gospel, for the whole world. Right. So as we, you know, talk about, you know, so what do you what do you talk about um, uh, with people that that don't know Jesus or, or you know have had varying uh, experiences and things like that? First thing, Jesus. Throughout his ministry, the one, the, the one thing that where he actually used statements is when he said, the kingdom of God is like, all right? And over and over, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. And, uh, and it's a little confusing because Matthew, instead of saying the kingdom of God is like, Matthew always writes it as the kingdom of heaven is like. Well, Matthew was writing to Jews and he didn't, um, you know, he, he had to write it in such a way that they wouldn't immediately bristle at Oh, said God. And, um, you know, to, to this day, uh, Orthodox Jews, when they write God, they write G underscore D. All right. Um, there's a really fascinating story that we don't have time to get to tonight of how we ended up with the word Jehovah that was started out as Yahweh. But it has to do with that. Um, and uh, so when you look at the things that Jesus said, where he said the kingdom of God is like, most of the time, like nine times out of ten, again, making up that number, he was talking about life here on earth. All right? He was talking about this is, this is how God's kingdom works here. All right? Usually he wasn't talking about heaven, the new creation, eternity. He's talking about right here and now. All right? And so he's talking about the kingdom is where God and Humanity intersect, where God and his creation intersect, right? Where the two come together. And um, this, was, this is something that it took me a long time uh, to figure this out. I mean, I had heard that definition, but it didn't click for me. And, um, but then I realized that the more I read the Bible, that, um, that, that I found that when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, I realized that I'm, I'm looking at it going, oh, oh, oh. He's talking about life here on earth. Oh, but he's also talking about in eternity. And there's a continuity between the two. We tend to see things as like, here's earth, and then death. <laughs> Big chasm, heaven. All right? But that's only because of sin. And, and so we see the fulfillment in Revelation, at the end of Revelation, where we see heaven and earth Heaven comes down to earth, and, and the, the two are joined. And then you're like, so wait, where, what's heaven? Like, it's all together. Okay? But then I realized that that section is not talking about the end of the world. It's talking about God's kingdom coming to the earth now. That we, the church, are the new Jerusalem. And so, um, so then I realized, oh, this is what happens when the church goes into the world. <sighs> Mind blown. And it's amazing. All right? So if we can communicate that to people, this, this is not about, you know, jumping through hoops. It's, it's like, well, I'll become a Christian right before I die so that I can go to heaven, but right now I want to have fun. All right? If that's what you're thinking, then you don't get Christianity. Because Christianity is fun, even when it's not fun. Even when things are bad, even when you get, you know, people in other countries that are being persecuted for their faith and, and are, are watching their families die around them, all right, and getting gunned down in, in all kinds of torture. And yet, and, and they probably wouldn't use the word fun, all right. But there's a joy and an inner peace and, a, um, you know, that... 
you know, where, where people are saying this is how the, the church has grown throughout the ages, the people said, it's worth it. Right? That's what the kingdom of God is all about. All right? Next about love. We talked a lot about this tonight. All right? And we should. And um, uh, to the point that we're running out of time, and so um, I think I've probably talked enough about it and, but made the point. But again, this is the topic. It's back to love, not what hoops you jump through. All right? And then life is better with Jesus. Uh, this is a tweet that... Um, that, that I just happened to stumble across many, and this is a term I hadn't even seen up till this point, exvangelicals. In other words, used to be evangelical, right, and left. Kids grew up seeing their parents as the mediators and mouthpieces between themselves and an angry deity. And so I, I saw that, and I just, I had a reply. I said, I've seen this too often. A lot of the teens at our church had bad experiences, got kicked out of other churches. I wish more experience the love instead, All right? And what she can't see in that little um, uh, screenshot there is that she liked my um, my uh, my response. All right, she appreciated that. And um, and you know, and, and here's here's someone who had personally had a bad reaction, but then when I came and said, "Yeah, but it shouldn't be like that," you know, that's not what it's about. She went, "Yeah." <laughs> all right, that's all the further it went. But. Um, I mean, I've, I've had other conversations with other people where, that are not Christians, and, and when you respond and say, yeah, love doesn't always happen the way that it should, um, they go, yeah, and, and, you know, there's sort of this, this understanding that, like, there should be more love. Um, and, and so, and when we have that, life is better. Um, just knowing that no matter how bad things are, no matter how you know things fall apart, it's all right, I've got Jesus. I'm good. Um, and, and for people to, to you know to just to communicate that <clears throat> to people that um, and, you know here's here's how and so which brings to the next one, what if Jesus? And um, you know this is uh, I've talked about like praying the media and things like that where. Um, where you look at a situation and go, how would this be different if the people that were involved in that situation had uh, just an awareness of Christ's presence in their lives and, and that they're in his hands and he's taking care of them and loves them and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff? How different would it be? And so to have those kind of conversations, to, to look at those situations and just say, you know, it's, you know, um, oh, you know, there's a guy that, uh, you know, to the or push the kid off, you know, the Mall of America, and, and you go, and and you see the the, the news stories came out today that there, that he, he went in there looking for somebody to to kill. You know, what? And then and so you know you'd be quick to go, that's terrible. But then I look at that and go, I mean, he needs Jesus. How different would his life be? How different would little Landon's life be if that guy knew Jesus? And, and to just talk about why that's the case. All right. Obstacles. You can't get there from here. You have to start somewhere else. All right. Sometimes you, you've got a, you're in a, a, a conversation with someone, and it's just, you can tell this is not getting better. All right. Or, or you've, you've tried to talk to them about different things, and it just, it just doesn't work. All right. Sometimes you just have to you have to back off and and go. All right, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this another time, or we'll you know maybe we'll, we'll try a, a different approach another time, or, or you know we'll, sometimes it's just the timing's not right. And, and um, boy, I've seen so often that there has to be a crisis um, before people are. You know, it's like, uh, you, because we, we are really good at worshiping ourselves. That's why pride is the number one sin in the Bible, mm. right? As long as I've got my life under control, I don't need Jesus. But when things fall apart, and I realize that I don't have, that that control was an illusion, that's a crisis. And so sometimes it's then you say, this might help. 
Um, how can I love uh, when they won't hear? All right? Different people experience love in uh, different ways. Have you guys ever heard of the five love languages? All right. This is a this is this is something I always talk about with couples, and that's kind of how it started out. All right. Different people experience love in different ways. Um, uh, Gary Chapman, I believe, is the name of the, the guy. You can, if you go to fivelovelanguages.com, you can actually find out like what yours is and what your um, what your spouse or partner's is, uh, which is really helpful. They even have ones for like coworkers and your kids <laughs> and stuff like that, right? Because different people experience love in different ways. Um, and this is where you have like, he doesn't love me. What do you mean I don't love you? I work all kinds of overtime so that I can make enough money to buy you all kinds of nice gifts. Yeah, I just want you to spend time with me. Oh. They love each other. It's just a disconnect, and they're not experiencing love the, the way they need to experience it. Right? So, uh, according to um, this book, The Five Love Images, there's, these five are number one, words of encouragement. Right? Oh, and this is in no particular order, okay? Um, the, uh, to, the sort of like, like compliments or nice job. Hey, that was awesome. Okay. Um, physical touch, right? Which is not necessarily, and it really is not, when a lot of people, when they think physical touch, they, they immediately think sexual, right? And especially if you're not talking to your spouse. It's not what we're talking about, okay? Um, but, but, you know, sometimes it's just a, it's a, it's a fist bump, you know, or, a, you know, kind of, a nudge or, or something like that, all right? Sometimes it's a hug. Man, that's that's one of the things that a lot of kids in our, our youth group, uh, it's like they're, they're like hug starved. And, uh, and they, they just sort of like have these pileups where they're just like absorbing love from each other. And, um, all right, so just, you know, sitting close to somebody or, you know, or, or whatever. And obviously, depending on the situation, what's appropriate, Right, um, but that you know, sometimes it's, it's a matter of. Um, I find it to be really powerful that someone's struggling. You say, "Can I pray for you?" Right, and and a lot of times people will go, you know, like, um, okay, right. You put your hand on his shoulder, you know, hey God, please, you know, be with them, whatever, and just that that physical connection. Um, oh, uh, they found that. Um, that people, uh, they did a study where uh, giving people change, um, like at a cash register, all right, that, that if, the, if the person, when they put the change in the person's hand, touched their hand as they did it, as opposed to just sort of like dropping it or whatever, that they left feeling better. They had a more positive experience there. Um, on average, than than those who did, um, just because of that that physical connection, right? Our skin is our biggest organ in our body. Um, all right. So, uh, but other people like don't touch me. Like they don't want to be touched. All right. Um, for others, it's quality time. Just, just spend time with me. All right. And quality time often goes together with listening. Right. Which we talked a lot about. Right. How was your day? That kind of stuff. Just, just spending time. Right? Um, another one is acts of service. Uh, you know, uh, doing the dishes or for, for your spouse, but it's, it's also just, you know, just helping people out. Um, just however you can. And then, and then gifts. And by the way, if, if your love language is gifts, if you feel really loved, um, when, when someone gives you gifts, that's not shallow, okay? When someone sees uh, something, uh, you know, at the store, some, and it doesn't have to be expensive, it could be just be some goofy little, you know, 50 cent trinket, right? But they see it and, they, and it reminds them of you and they get it for you. And I saw this and I thought of you. So, so here, man, that can be huge, right? And so different, since different people, a lot, sometimes if we're communicating love to someone in a way that's not their primary love language, um, then 
they might not receive it as well as if we find another way. And so this goes back to listening and getting what, what makes a person feel welcome and accepted and cared about. Right? And, um, and so the more you get a sense of that. And, and one of the easiest ways to do that is to see how they love other people. What, what's the way that they tend to communicate love to other people? Right? And if you watch for that, then if you kind of follow that, if they're communicating love to other people, then that's, that's probably their love language, the, their sort of heart language. That, so then if you can communicate love to them, even if it's not the way you normally would because it's not yours, that's still that's a way that, that's going to connect with them and it's going to make them feel cared about. Right? Um, ask them a question that you want or... Um, that you want them to ask you. So, how, what you know? What do you what do you think about God? Or what do you think about you know Christianity or, or whatever? All right. And and ask them that question. And see, because we have our, our culture is somewhat reciprocal. That by asking someone a question, there's sort of a almost like an implied, like, why? How do you see it? Well, thanks for asking. All right, but it opens up a conversation. All right, and again, like don't be devious with any of this stuff. And this is all about being real and, and honest with people. All right, but these are just little you know things that how to deal with. So uh, another thing, an indirection, quite spiritual topics, and this is like um, kind of the the opening bit about it. oh what did you do this weekend? Oh well, I went to church, you know. And it could be like, oh, it was church. Oh, and, and you know, the, there was this, this, this line from, from the song that we sang that, that really clicked for me. And, and it's just, and I, like, it was like, these were the, the words. And, and, and it was just like, wow, this is great, you know. Um, and, uh, and then the more you get to know a person, the more you know, you know, kind of how far you can go with that. But um, we say, oh, you know, oh, I hung out with some of my friends from church um, and, uh, you know, or, or whatever. And to, to introduce things that way, I, I read a story about someone who um, they were talking to someone. It, this person was like a lighting person. And they were talking about, uh, oh, yeah, I was at church and they, they just got these, these new lights. It's like this kind. You guys have that kind of light at church? Oh, yeah, yeah, we get a, a bunch of them. And like, oh, well, hey, why don't you come? And then you can see them in action. Oh, okay, you know, and so like they came for the lights, but they heard the gospel, you know. I mean, so sometimes there's there's sort of roundabout ways to based on people's interests. How do you know their interests? By listening to them. All right, introduce them to your Christian friends. This is what Matthew did, by the way, as in the Gospel of Matthew, Levi, the father of the tax collector. All right, um, Jesus calls him to follow him. So what does he do? He has a party, he invites all of his friends. And all of Jesus' disciples. Hey, all my tax collector friends, meet Jesus' disciples. Hey, you guys should talk. All right? Have you ever heard this referred to as a Matthew party? All right? If you have friends that aren't Christians, right? Have a party, invite those friends, and invite a bunch of people from church. Have them get to know each other. All right? And by the way, I have thoughts on this, on, on things that we could do as a congregation, too. To, to make those connections that don't necessarily have to be Bible studies, that can be ways that we can grow together and reach out at the same time. All right. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time. Um, um, okay, I'm over time. Um, <laughs> I don't have time, but um, is there... Let, let me do this. Um, if everyone could could write down or you, know, you can give me a note, email me, whatever. Since, since next time we're going to be um, kind of like, it's, it's kind of like a catch-all, anything that we haven't covered yet, all right? Here's what I'd like you to do uh, for next time. Um, give me your questions, your, your situations, um, your, uh, you know, relationship where you, you really want to connect with someone and you're having a hard time doing it, all right? And we'll take some time and we'll talk about those and we'll kind of 
try to work through those and, and, and give you some um, some ways. I mean, hopefully some of the stuff that we hit tonight um, will, will help with that, but I know I kind of got rushed at the end. Um, and uh, but, but next time we'll have more time uh, to do that. And, and I'm leaving time for specifically for that. And um, so if you can give me those, if you give it to me in advance, it'll give me a little time to, you know, to think about it, it'd be a little more helpful. Um, if things come up at the time, that'll be great too. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, the more of that, and it can, as many as you want. Um, and then and we'll, we'll work through that, that stuff and talk about um, what we have. So those are your questions. And then, um, uh, I can't remember what I put down here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So this is this goes back to the first session we talked about. Um, you know, who who are three people that, that you really really want to focus on? Maybe you've got five. Maybe you got two. Um, but think about some of these things we hit on today, and hopefully the questions in the handout will help you with that too. Um, and and then so just think about um, how can I take some of that and you know, already before next month, and how could I maybe try some of that if you have the opportunity to actually try it out, go for it. Um, and uh, but but you know kind of take a look at that and and how how you might be able to use some of those um, some of those things um, you know starting those conversations and things like that. Or, or maybe even, oh, um, one other thing I almost forgot. Um, with uh, when we're talking about the five love languages, all right, sometimes it's expressing love to that person in a way that they can hear it. Sometimes it's expressing love with that person, right? So it can be like, like if, it's, if acts of service is their thing, say, hey, you want to, like, this weekend, I know Habitat for Humanity is doing a bill, like, and, and I know that you're pretty good with a hammer. Um, you want to go and, and do that together? Right? Or, you know, kind of think about those things um, where you're actually, like, you're not serving them, you're serving with them. Right? Because here's the thing, love is a two-way thing. And, um, and we, we experience God's love. God's love is made complete when not only do we receive it fully, but we are able to um, to give it. Um, and this is, I mean, this is something I just figured out a couple of years ago. Um, that, I, you know, Jesus said, it's funny, Paul quotes this, we don't actually have in the Gospels Jesus actually saying what Paul said, Jesus said it, so we're good with that. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And, and for, I mean, for the longest time, I, I, I saw, I was kind of looked at that as like, like you give and God goes, blessing, right? Gold star. Um, and then I went, that totally contradicts the gospel. What does that mean? And then I realized, no, you know what? When I do something nice for somebody, it feels good. I'd rather be the person at the soup kitchen um, handing out soup than the one receiving it, right? I, 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 at, the, at the end of the day, if I have done stuff for my wife, for my kids, for whoever else has come into my life um, that day, and I've been able to do things to make their day better, then I had a good day, even if nobody did anything for me. Right? Why? Because we're created in God's image, and, and God, God's nature is to give love. Right? We are designed for that purpose. And so, once we recognize that, um, and then we have the opportunity to demonstrate that to someone and actually give them a taste of it, like, oh, this is pretty cool. Right? And I've seen a lot of churches that their evangelism program is... They go and serve the poor, but their sort of targets are not the poor that they're serving. They're, hey, bring your friends to go do this. And then what happens is people go, I mean, I, I've even heard stories where people are doing this and then like their friends are coming along and they're doing stuff and they're like, wait, you guys are a church? Yeah. Oh. I'd like to be a part of a church that does that. 
And some of this that doesn't, you know, really even know who Jesus is. But they're like, hey, I like what you're about. Tell me more. You know? And um, so. All right. I'm, I'm cutting it off and I'm not asking for questions because <laughs> we're over time. Yeah. But I'm asking for you to, to bring me your questions between now and next time. All right? All right. Let's close the prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your gospel. Thank you for the amazing love that you've, that you've given to us. Help us to see that love more clearly. Help us to just all the time to see more and more clearly the amazing love that you have for us, the completely unconditional love that you give to us. And so that, so that it just fills us up and overflows from us into the lives of others so that they see it and they go, wow, what is that? Um, do that in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.